Well, let's go ahead and start this morning. You know, uh, I heard the story about two brothers who were getting ready to boil some eggs. And the older brother turned to the younger brother and said, if, if you let me break three of these on your heads, I'll give you $10. And the, kid, the younger one said, promise? And the older one said, of course, I promise. So very happily, the older boy broke the first egg on his brother's head, and then another one. And, and the, younger, the younger brother, he just braced for the, the last egg, but nothing came. Ain't you going to break the third egg, the boy asked? Nah, if I did that, I'd owe you $10. <laughs> uh, promises aren't always what we think of them to be, right? In our world, we're taught if it sounds too good to be true, it probably yes. is. Exactly. So many of us have been taken by empty promises in our life. That we're leery of anything or anyone that tells us we can have something for nothing. The truth of the matter is, the world is full of empty promises. We watch TV. The advertisements tell us that we can be happy, we can be rich, we can be famous. If we, if we just buy that certain product, we'll get all those things, right? And you listen to our politicians and the media. It doesn't take long before we've been fooled enough to know that the world's promises are full of emptiness, sadly. Right? I recently came across this story. It was told by Dear Abby in response to someone's question. It seems a young man from a wealthy family was about to graduate from high school. It was the custom in that wealthy neighborhood for the parents to give the graduate an automobile. I apparently did not live in the, that same wealthy neighborhood. Bill and his father spent months looking at cars together, and the week before the graduation, they had found that perfect car. But on the eve of his graduation, his father simply handed him a gift wrap Bible. Bill was so angry, he threw the Bible down and he just stormed out of the house. He and his father never saw each other again. It was the news of his father's death that brought Bill back home. As he sat one night going through his father's possessions that he was to inherit, he came across the Bible that his father had given him. He brushed away the dust and he opened it to find there was a cashier's check dated the day of his graduation in the exact amount of the car they had chosen together. You know, I think a lot of us, we, we treat God's promises that way. We, we treat them as if they're uh, nothing to be paying attention to. He's, he's given us wonderful promises and plans, and we just ignore them. Our God is a God of promises. Did you know the Bible records over 7,000 promises from God to his people? But we live in a world of broken promises and unfulfilled expectations. We make commitments and don't follow through. We make plans and promises that we never really intended to keep. But God has never made a promise that he never uh, would keep, uh, keep true. Instead of promises full of emptiness, on Easter he gave us emptiness that is full of promise. And this morning I want you to think about some of the promises with me of Easter. I'd like for you to turn with me to the book of Luke. Luke 24, 24th chapter, beginning with verse 1. It will be on the screen as well. And it reads as follows. But very early on Sunday morning, the women went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. They found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance, so they went in. But they didn't find the body of the Lord Jesus. As they stood there puzzled, two men suddenly appeared to them clothed in dazzling robes. The women were terrified and bowed with their faces to the ground. And then the men asked, why are you looking among the dead? For someone who is alive. He isn't here. He's risen from the dead. Remember what he told you back in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be betrayed into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and that he would rise again on the third day. Then they remembered that he had said this. So they rushed back from the tomb to tell his 11 disciples and everyone else what had happened. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, several other women who told the apostles what had happened. But the story sounded like nonsense to them, so they didn't believe it. However, Peter jumped up and ran to the tomb to look. Stooping in, he peered in, and he saw the empty linen wrappings, and then he went home again, wondering what had happened. You can imagine what's going through their minds. They, they had just lost their master. They had just lost their, their rabbi, if you will, and so they are going forward without him, and then to find out he's not there. He's not where he should be. I'm going, to like, I'm going to try and share with you three Easter promises this morning. The, the very fact that each of these is empty assures us that God's promises are very, very real. 
How so? Here's the first promise that God gives you. Number one is the empty cross. The promise of forgiveness. God forgives us not because we've earned it, not because we've deserved it. He forgives us simply because he loves us. The empty cross is the sign of God's promise to forgive. Romans 5.8 says it this way, But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And so while we were sinners, while we were, were trying to avoid God, God still sent his son to die for us. And it was on that cross that Jesus offered his perfect body, his sinless life, on behalf of you and I so that we could enjoy salvation. You know, nobody else. Abraham, David, Moses, Elijah, Muhammad, Buddha. No one else has lived a perfect life and then offered that sinless life for our death. So you and I can be saved, nobody but Jesus. And that's why the Bible says there's no other name under heaven by which men can be saved. It's his name, Jesus. When Jesus breathed his last and he cried, it is finished. The penalty was paid on that cross, that empty cross. As you, as, I, as you and I think on those three crosses, I want us to focus momentarily here on that middle one because that's the one that Jesus died on, right? Did you, do you notice the blood at the top? That came from the crown of thorns that they just crushed onto his head. Can you notice the blood stains on the ends of the cross beam? Yeah, that was where they put the nails into his hands. And notice how bloody the whole piece of wood down the middle is. The Roman soldiers whipped him till he was just shredding and bleeding. And then they stuck a sword in his side. And the blood is still there on the cross. Why did that soldier put that sword in there? To make sure he was what? Dead. And dead he was. Don't let anybody tell you that Jesus didn't die. The soldiers knew it. The Jews knew it. The Romans knew it. You know, before that day, if God would have taken down his books and would have looked at the name of, of anybody, he'd have seen a huge list, and every list would say what? Guilty of sin, guilty of sin, guilty of sin. And a little girl sat at, uh, a little girl, it appears, sat at the table in her living room with a pencil and paper and with a look of very deep concentration on her face. And after several minutes, she sat her pencil down, picked up her paper, and walked soberly to her mother. In all seriousness, she said, Mom, would you like to see the list of all my sins? Curiously timid, Mom took the paper and read the list. It read as follows. Jackson, Jason, Mason, Simpson, and Carson. That was a list of her sins that she knew of. But we all have lists of sins, don't we? Only our sins aren't a part of someone's name. What, what sins make your list? What sins make my list? Is it anger? Or maybe addiction. It could be pride or, or prejudice. Perhaps lustful eyes or a lying tongue. Maybe it's selfishness or sexual uh, promiscuity. My sins will be different from yours. Yours will be different from mine. But each of us has a list. In fact, it's a very long list of sins. And every sin on your list comes with a price tag. A lifetime of sin is enough to rack up some major debt in heaven. You yell at your kids. Cha-ching. You covet your friend's car? Cha-ching. You envy your neighbor's success? Cha-ching. You lie? Cha-ching. You lose control? Cha-ching. You give in to temptation? Cha-ching. You fall asleep during one of my sermons? Cha-ching, cha-ching, cha-ching. <laughs> but if God were to go to my book today, George's book, do you know what he, what he would find there? What he did when I accepted his own son, Jesus Christ, as my Savior and my Lord? For those of you who are familiar with word processors on the computer, he basically went to his heavenly computer and he pulled up my page and he selected all of it and hit control X. He just deleted all of it, right? Then he flipped over to Jesus's page and he hit control V. He put everything on his page. And then he went back to my page and in Jesus's own blood, he wrote across the top of my page, three simple words, forgiven, forgiven, forgiven. My page is clean, other than the blood that says forgiven. And all of my sins were transferred to Jesus' page in God's book. And that we can truly say amen to. Amen. And not just for me, for all of us that have come and said, please forgive me, Jesus Christ, and come in and, and into my life and lead me in my life. 
You know, right here I've got a, a, a simple receipt. What's the purpose of a receipt? Other than to make my wife mad when I buy something I'm not supposed to. What, what is the purpose of a receipt? <laughs> it's a, it shows the payment was made, right? It was on that cross that Jesus paid the penalty for our sins. And that is our receipt. That's how we know that we have been redeemed. Now, sin. That's a word that's not really popular anymore. Some people think it's kind of bad. Actually, it is kind of bad. But the simple fact of the matter is we have all sinned. Every one of us, you, the person next to you, the person behind you, the person in front of you, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The only person who has ever lived a sinless life is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Everyone else has failed. So here's the problem. According to God's law, we read two things. One, the wages of sin is death, and the soul that sins will surely die. So because we've sinned, we deserve what? Eternal death. We deserve hell. The empty cross tells me that I can be free of that, though. I can be free of my past and instead have a great life in and through Jesus Christ as my Savior. Before you received the promise of the empty cross, there was an emptiness you cannot fill. Yet after you received the promise of the empty cross, that emptiness is suddenly filled. The second empty thing we see in the resurrection is the empty tomb. It reminds us of God's gift of eternal life for everyone who trusts in Jesus Christ. Matthew 28, 5-6 says, Then the angel spoke to the women. Don't be afraid, he said. I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He isn't here. He is risen from the dead, just as he said would happen. Come and see where his body was lying. You know, the tomb in which Jesus was laid to rest belonged to Joseph of Arimathea. It was a newly carved crypt cut out in the side of the rock wall. Essentially, it was a man-made cave with rock slab benches inside. And I've heard somebody say that a friend later pulled Joseph aside and said, Joseph, that was such a beautiful, expensive tomb. Why on earth did you give it to someone else to be buried in? Joseph just smiled, according to this person, and said, why not? He only needed it for the weekend. <laughs> that conversation may never have happened, actually, but it's, but it's true nonetheless, right? <laughs> Romans chapter 8, verse 11. The Spirit of God, who raised Jesus from the dead, lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by the same Spirit living within you. Another story I read this week was about Jeremy. Jeremy was not a normal child. No. Yeah. <laughs> Neither is our Jeremy. <laughs> but Jeremy was not a normal child. He had a terminal illness which affected both his body and his mind. Still, his parents had tried to give him as normal a life as possible. They, they, they sent him to a church school, got him good counseling. At the age of 12, Jeremy was only in second grade. Seemingly unable to learn. He was a frustration to his teacher. He was a frustration to all the children in his class. <clears throat> Springtime came and the children talked excitedly about the coming of Easter. It was a church school, by the way, not a public school. And so they were excited about the coming of Easter. Their teacher told them the story of Jesus. And then to emphasize the idea of new life springing forth, she gave each of the children a large plastic egg with one assignment. I want you to take this home and bring it back tomorrow with something inside that shows new life. Do you understand? And all the children responded enthusiastically, yes, Miss Miller. All of them except for Jeremy. He just listened carefully, his eyes never leaving the teacher's face. Had he understood what she had told him about Jesus' death and resurrection? Did he understand the assignment? The teacher thought maybe she should call his parents and and explained the project to them, but then she got busy and she forgot. Next morning, 19 children came to school with 19 large eggs, laughing and talking as they placed their eggs in a large wicker basket on Miss Miller's desk. After they had completed their math lesson, it was time to open those eggs. And the first egg, Miss Miller found a flower, and she said, Oh, yeah, flowers are certainly a sign of new life. And when plants peek through the ground, we know that spring is here. Very good. And a small girl in the first row waved her arms and said, that's, that's my egg, Mrs. Miller, or Miss Miller. She called out. The next egg contained a plastic butterfly, which looked real. The teacher held it up and she said, you know, we all know that a caterpillar changes and grows into a beautiful butterfly. 
And yes, that's new life too. Little Judy smiled proudly and said, Miss Miller, that one's mine. Next, the teacher found a rock with moss on it. She thought it a little. She said, well, you know, the, the moss too shows light. Billy spoke up from the back of the classroom. My dad helped me with that one. <laughs> then the teacher opened the fourth egg, but the egg was empty. Surely it must be Jeremy, she thought, and obviously he didn't understand her instructions. If only she hadn't forgotten to phone his parents. Because she didn't want to embarrass him, she quietly set the egg aside and reached for the next one. But suddenly Jeremy spoke up, Miss Miller, aren't you going to talk about my egg? And a bit flustered, the teacher said, but, but Jeremy, your egg is empty. He looked into her eyes and said softly, yeah, but Jesus' tomb was empty too. Amen. Amen is right. Truly, the greatest symbol of new life is found in an empty tomb. If you and I went back and looked at those ladies we read about after pausing briefly to look at the cross, they continue on their way down the path, and as they go, they're probably wondering aloud, who's going to move that big stone that's in the way? And even if we could do that with a company of soldiers who had sealed his tomb and guarding it, the only way that you could move the stone is with their permission, with their authorization. Why should they even continue? But they did. And when the women got to the tomb, the stone was rolled away already. The tomb was empty. Jesus was gone. Now, there are some who think the women just went to the wrong tomb. But because of their grief and their pain, their confusion, they just went to the wrong place. After all, it was early in the morning. It was probably a little dark. Of course, the problem with that theory is that once word spread about the empty tomb, the disciples raced there to check it out, and they got to the right tomb. Someone would have made sure they went to the right place, and if the disciples somehow got it all wrong, as news of Jesus spread, the Roman officials and religious leaders definitely would have double-checked and made sure. They wanted Jesus dead. So they would have to check the tomb out for themselves and correct any mistakes that have been made. But since no one has since stepped forward to correct the disciples, we know that they had the right tomb and that tomb was empty. Instead, they made up a lie. They lied and said the disciples stole the body. So imagine this with me, if you would. Eleven fishermen overpowering a company of Roman soldiers, moving a two-ton stone and stealing the body of Jesus so that they could just claim that he came to life, and then willing to die for a lie. It makes no sense. The world gives us promises full of emptiness. God gives us emptiness full of promise. So how does this, how does this work, this empty tomb? Well, here's another example of something. A father and son were traveling down a country road one afternoon in the springtime, lots of flowers, lots of bees, and when suddenly a bee flew into the window, being deathly allergic to bee stings, the boy began to panic as the bee buzzed all around inside the car. Seeing the horror on his child's face, the father reached out and caught the bee in his hand. Soon he opened his hand and the bee began to buzz around once again. And again the boy began to panic. But the father reached over to his son and opens his hand and, and shows the stinger that's still in his palm. He says, relax, son. I took the sting. That bee can't hurt you anymore. The empty tomb is God's way of saying, relax, my child. I took the sting. Death can't hurt you anymore. Amen. Now, why is the empty tomb of Jesus so important? It's not because of the remains of the person who was buried there. It's not because it's an important piece of architecture that needs to be protected. This tomb is important simply because it is what? It's empty. The world has never been the same because of that empty tomb. Before that day, not many really cared about the empty tomb. Well, the 11 disciples, some followers, a few angry Pharisees, they were about the only ones who cared. However, today, close to half the world's population are Christ followers, and they care. How can that, three billion people, be explained? Max Lucado, you may recognize the name, he's a proficient Christian author. He wrote in his book, He Chose the Nails, he wrote this. He said, Jesus was a backwater peasant. He never wrote a book never held an office. He never journeyed more than 200 miles from his hometown. Friends left him, one betrayed him. Those he helped forgot him. Prior to his death, they abandoned him. But after his death, they couldn't resist him. What made the difference? The answer is the empty tomb. The empty tomb speaks of new life, not just for him, but for us as well. It's for us who believe a promise of new and eternal life 
It's like God was saying, relax, my child. I have st taken the sting. I've taken everything you feared about death out of it. And now it's just a doorway into heaven, if you'll just trust me. But it doesn't end there. There's one more promise that I want you to know about Easter. And that would be the empty burial clothes, which represent a promise of a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Because all of this means nothing if we don't have that relationship. And back to our story here. John 20, verse 5 says, He stooped and looked in. This would be um, John stooped in. He stooped and looked in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he didn't go in. And then Simon Peter arrived and went inside. He also noticed the linen wrappings lying there, while the cloth that covered Jesus' head was folded up and lying apart from the other wrappings. And the disciples who had reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and he believed. You know, here's what happened to bodies back then. We, we think we just give it to the Smith Mortuary, and that's all we've got to deal with. But ba bodies back then had a, a certain ritual. The body of Jesus was washed, and then it was meticulously wrapped around and around and around. Each leg and foot, it was the custom around that time. Each arm up to the neck and around the waist area. Wrapped within the linen wrappings were 75 pounds of spices to help control the obvious stench. A separate cloth was used to cover the head and the face. A huge stone was placed and sealed at the entrance along with the Roman guards to guard the tomb from robbery. But the Jewish leaders said that's exactly what happened. The body was stolen. Have, anyone in you, have you ever experienced a robbery? Did somebody ever rob your house? Right? I have. And let me tell you, robbers don't neatly fold anything. In fact, they do exactly the opposite. Everything they touch is stripped down, ripped down, thrown around, and dumped on the floor. However, the cloth that had covered Jesus' head was folded up neatly, lying off to the side. The linen wrappings were not unwound. They weren't scattered about. They weren't cut off. They simply were lying there like an empty cocoon. The empty grave cloths forever change Peter and John, and they will do the same for you as they did for me. Once you receive the promise of the empty grave clothes, it will forever change you. The empty grave clothes means that the body of Jesus is up and walking around. The resurrected Jesus was not a ghost. He wasn't a spirit. Jesus himself was alive, and he was present with his friends. We know that. It wouldn't be long before Jesus himself would appear to Mary Magdalene and all the apostles, and eventually to over 500 people. Jesus, a physical bodily Jesus, would sit down with and talk with and walk with and eat with them. Once again, they would be able to fellowship with their Lord. You see, that is the promise of the empty burial cloth. Jesus is alive and wants to fellowship with you. The empty grave clothes promise us that an ongoing relationship with Jesus Christ is possible and open to every single one of us. So in the emptiness of Easter, we see three powerful promises. An empty cross tells that Jesus did die, and through his death we are forgiven. An empty tomb tells us that the death has been defeated and we have a hope of eternal life. And the empty grave clothes tell us that Jesus is alive and he is here with us today. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now, I'm going to ask you to turn to just two more verses, and then we'll be completed this morning. Two more verses in the Bible. Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death. death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. And to emphasize it further, Paul said in Romans 10, 13, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Isn't that wonderful? God promises everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, they will be saved. My question to you is this, will you take him at his word? This morning, if you never received Jesus, whether online or here in this room, if you've never received Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, if you've never taken advantage of the forgiveness and the eternal life and that personal relationship he offers, why not do that this morning? Why delay? He's so desiring of all of us to have and enjoy those promises. We, we shouldn't delay one more day. God wants to move in your life. He just wants you to connect with him. What are you going to do with Jesus? What are you going to do with the one who died for you? That's the question I can't answer. Only you can answer that question. 
Though through Jesus' empty cross, empty tomb, and empty grave clothes, God can fill your emptiness with promise. In fact, it's the only way your life will ever be fully filled. Now, I won't have you turn there, but in Mark 15, it talks about the very first convert. You know who the first convert was to Christianity? It was the Roman soldier who was standing by his guard. And when Jesus said, it is finished, and he saw all that had happened, he said what? Truly, this is the Son of God. He was converted. Imagine that. The first guy into the Jewish temple was a Roman centurion who now trusted in Jesus Christ as his personal Savior. If there's room for that guy, there's room for you, and there's room for me. I can get in. You can get in. Don't listen to that small voice telling you you're not good enough. Maybe you made too many mistakes or too large of mistakes or too much time has passed. That's the enemy trying to talk to you. We need to know where God is on all of this. So we're going to take time to pray now. You guys could bow your heads with me. God, we thank you for the privilege to be your sons and your daughters. Not any of us today deserve to be here, to be accepted by you. Instead, it's by your amazing love. God, I want to reach out to those here today who feel far from your love, who feel disconnected from you. And I ask you this morning, where do you feel you are with God? Some of you may be this message pierced right through your heart like an arrow. You've heard these voices. You believe these voices. Well, then this Easter is for you. He can heal those things that are broken in you and in your life. If you make him not only your Savior, but your Lord, if you follow him, and it's a prayer I've said myself. I just said, Jesus, I need you. I want you to forgive me, to wash me, to make me brand new. Maybe you've never said this prayer, and this day is for you. God put all of this in motion. You are here today because of that. Maybe you need time to renew your faith in him. Today is your day. This is your moment. Not to embarrass you or bring anyone forward. But if this is you, after the sermon, if you connect with me and just let me know that you prayed this prayer with us this, day, this afternoon, that would be so neat. Uh, or you can even identify that on the connection card. But I would ask that you just lift your, your voices with me as we join in this prayer together. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus I embrace you today. I receive your love. I confess my sins. And I ask your forgiveness. I believe that you are the Son of God. And I am forever yours. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.